Cool. So, hey, folks, welcome back to the Inside the Mix podcast. And in this episode, I'm very excited to welcome our guest today, Daniel Hugh. Uh, he is a self-confessed synth pop artist with a with an English accent, but similar to me. Uh, signed to Retro Reverb Records. Um, for those of you who uh, may or may not be aware, actually, uh, Dan featured on episode 22, so that's series one of the podcast, and we discussed the culture of synthwave scene, synth pop songwriting, the advantages and challenges of the recording studio and uh, songwriting and production as an art. So after this episode, if you want to go back and learn a bit more about Dan's, uh, Dan's history, you can go back and uh, listen to episode 22 or cue it up. Um, so yeah, Dan, thanks for joining me today. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Thanks very much for having me again. Uh, not a problem. My pleasure, mate. Not my, my pleasure. Uh, where are you joining us uh, from today? From Northampton, my my living room in Northampton, <laughs> <laughs> centre of the good. universe, as I like to call it. <laughs> so, in this episode, Dan's going to share with us his experiences surrounding the uh, the Daniel Hugh live performance uh, or setting it up for live performance. So, we'll be chatting about the up and coming new album as well. So, exciting stuff. Um, so, for those uh, listeners, the audience who aren't familiar with you, Dan, I've got your bio here, so I'll just quickly run through that. So, as I mentioned earlier, synth pop producer, um, you're from Northampton, where you are now. Uh, so, you spent a few years in a rock band, uh, embarked on a solo project in 2020, uh, resulting in an acoustic guitar led EP titled Stories Involving Time. So, your most recent release was Inspired by Immortals, would that be correct? Yeah, that's correct, yeah. Excellent. So, we got that described as a cross between Dreamwave and synth pop, and I love these influences. Uh, so, Cindy Lauper, Phil Collins, and Def Leppard. Absolutely love Def Leppard. Uh, Phil Collin is one of my favourite guitarists of all time. Huh? Um, fused together with contemporary songwriting and structure. So, um, yeah, Dan, so what I'd like to s- sort of kick off with is uh, tell our audience a bit about your sort of live performance experience. So going back to maybe your first gig. So can you remember what your first live performance was or and where? First sort of serious live performance that wasn't, um, sort of open mic at a pub or something like that was was probably my first band at university. So um, we set up a band. I was I was studying kind of sound en- sound engineering stuff. So there was lots of fellow musicians and stuff. And mm. we um, we I, I wrote a few very emo y uh <laughs> um emo-y pop punky sort of songs and um we started gigging and we were probably pretty terrible but um we managed to get some gigs in in uh camden uh i think the first gig was probably in um bar, at bar monster in camden i seem to remember and uh i think the headline act was supposed to be lower than atlantis who obviously oh, went wow. on to went on to great things but on the day before they <laughs> dropped out and um there was a replacement headline band featuring uh ian beale's son in eastenders <laughs> <laughs> so you know um not lower than atlantis but yeah. eastenders fame so yeah it was it was um it was a you know interesting experience really i was absolutely terrified first time i'd ever kind of played in front of people properly yeah. with a band and songs that i'd written and um yeah i probably didn't deal with it very well i think i kind of stood stone still on stage and just tried my best to get get from the start to the end without uh, making too many mistakes yeah yeah i've been there myself so you mentioned um camden now I, I, I remember playing camden i'm sure it was camden years ago in a band i was in and we played i want to say a place called the purple turtle does that ring a bell yeah I yeah I, I i never played there but I, they used to do good uh great rock club nights on mm. kind of friday and saturday nights. so we'd sometimes go i think i've been to a few gigs there um and it's quite it's quite compact isn't it it's quite a yeah. cool, cool space with quite a high up stage i seem yeah. to remember like yeah yeah, yeah. yeah really I cool think, venue i think it's closed down now we um we played there once and we made it and then the second time we were due to play there we uh we were driving from taunton so the audience listening that is uh the southwest uk so it's probably about two two and two and a half hours i think to london and we got lost with the other guitar with the other guitarist in his car in london and uh he he didn't 
this is around the time as well where we didn't have like in-car chargers or anything like that and uh we inevitably he got lost couldn't find his way around then have sat now and uh never made it so we didn't actually play the gig we drove all the way to london didn't play the gig we turned up just as we were supposed to go on stage and just basically just drove home again um Oh yeah. my god! Yeah, that, that, that's one <laughs> redeeming, <laughs> redeeming memory of playing London gigs, man. Oh, yeah. You got to try and take all the lessons you can learn from those experiences. I think oh, uh, it was awful, <laughs> awful. Uh, the, str- the, the stress of, I mean, the, 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 I was, I remember kind of feeling like or expecting sound check to be something a lot more kind of comprehensive and. Mm concrete that would actually help us in our performance or something it's yeah it's just like you might as well turn up you know if you're the opening support band you might as well just turn up five minutes before you're supposed to go on stage and, and yeah uh, and get on with it really for the, for the amount of um sort of care that sound guys generally give you but yeah <laughs> that's probably not fair on lots of sound guys but <laughs> i do i do i do recall similar things when, when you first gigged and like you were having the the, the com- conversing with the sound guy did you sort of like know what how to respond so did you have any idea of what you wanted in your monitors because i remember that they'd ask when i first started out they asked like what do you want in your monitors and i'd just be like i, I I don't know, a bit of everything <laughs> no i think i think probably what happened was a couple of the guys in the band had been in other bands and like sort of knew how what types of things to say and i probably just yeah. copied them to make it sound like <laughs> yeah. I knew what i'm talking about but, oh can i have a bit more of my guitar and yeah this? but i mean um to be fair it was like you know if you're playing at those kinds of venues in camden they actually do have some some decent sort of setups it's just if you're the opening band you're basically you'll go in doing your sound check and then you just start your set yeah and it's that awkward thing where like you're doing your sound check song and people like think you've started your set and then they <laughs> cheer they clap or cheer at the end of your song and you're like, no, no 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 don't don't clap yet we that wasn't yeah don't listen to us yet we, we haven't started but yeah yeah <laughs> Uh, I, I miss playing live for those reasons, Specific, especially when you're starting out as well. Great fun. Um, so how long would you say you've been performing live then? So wh- when was that that you started? I guess you're not performing live at the moment. So how many years in total were you sort of actively yeah, so that, performing? Yeah, so that was probably 2006, 2007. Um, so, yeah, 15, 15 or so years. And it's been quite a while since... I think I did one acoustic gig after I released that acoustic EP. Yeah. In that very short time where we weren't in lockdown. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think there was about a two month period where they started doing some live gigs again and then everything shut down again. And I, and, mm-hmm. uh, I released my EP, um, just as that was happening and, and did, a did a sort of acoustic set just at a local, um, really good local venue actually that they're, they, they kind of set up their whole beer garden to be like a, a tent with a really decent stage and decent sound setup and they um yeah um so it's really uh really cool place but don't love performing acoustic there's a lot of exposure when you yeah. just need an acoustic guitar yeah <laughs> i don't envy you there because i suppose when you're i i <laughs> this is quite bad now but when i was when i was in the band and there was another guitarist i always thought to myself, oh, it's all right if i make a mistake like you, you can get it hidden quite easily Mm. Um, but when you're playing acoustic it is very very yeah you're open to everything every little nuance every little subtle um yeah mistake you know yeah 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 there's there's no there's nowhere to hide yeah um, with an acoustic acoustic guitar singer songwriter type of thing you uh you, you just gotta you just gotta kind of it's it's difficult because experienced acoustic performers will just say yeah i make mistakes and you just you just roll with it and as long as you don't look too bothered when you make the mistake people people generally don't notice yeah <laughs> but that's all about kind of you know giving into the the moment and being present and enjoying it rather than analyzing everything that you're doing with every strum of the guitar and every note that you don't quite hit or <laughs> yeah or, I'm terrible for that as well. I know what I'm like. If I was to make like a real bad error, I, w- I would just want to stop. Um, yeah, which p- would be even worse. Yeah, that'd be <laughs> even worse. <laughs> just stopping dead. You know, yeah. I just, just start. I think I did. There was one gig where I did that, and I think it was 
I think it was me, and I was coming in with, uh, with like a lead guitar part, and I just totally messed it up, and I just stopped altogether. And then the rest of the band are just looking at me, and I'm like, I'm really sorry, guys. I just really, really, this is really bad. And then, but our drummer sort of saved it. Um, I've certainly had performances where it probably would have been better if I'd stopped. <laughs> I think. Yeah. I think that there was one where we uh, we went through a kind of series of band me- in that first band band members kind of leaving and trying to replace them and but we had like gigs lined up and had a friend who played played bass and our bass had just just left by mutual consent and uh, and um, tried to get him in uh, tried to get a friend in to play bass at short notice and he played a, played a whole song one fret down from the actual, <laughs> from the actual tuning so it was it was just like absolutely horrendous but um we just pretended like it was supposed to be like that and yeah <laughs> that nobody noticed i can't imagine that nobody noticed that but um but yeah you know these things happen yeah it's great I, what i find is when you get back together with those with the musicians as well and you just look back and think what on earth were we doing then like how what must have people thought when they were watching that oh, yeah days. yeah and yeah. so with regards to live performance is there like um was or was there sort of an act or an artist that sort of you took influence from with your sort of performance style if you have a performance style I don't think so. I think there were there were people that I wished I was that I wished I could be like yeah. people who had like such um confidence and or you know arrogance and made everybody look at them uh, and it wouldn't have mattered if they were dreadfully out of tune or not. People would yeah. have been absolutely uh you know just caught up in in their kind of persona and um my problem was that i was too aware of kind of what was going on in the crowd so if it was a really good busy room and people getting involved i would perform really well but if it was really quiet and and no one was really interested i would i would kind of go in on myself a little bit and and that and which kind of compounds the issue and almost ensures that no one's really going to get involved so um, I think that there were lots of uh, there were lots of bands around uh, around then around like the sort of late noughties like Young Guns. I don't know if you know Young Guns. I, I know of them. Yeah, yeah. Right. They they were. I mean, to be fair, I lived in Wickham at the time, and they they were from Wickham, so we used to kind of, um, you know, drink in the same student bars and and stuff yeah. like that but um but they just had such a cool like stage presence it was you know it was just uh real big energy like hard and heavy and and i i was like i'd love to be like that when when i'm performing and it wouldn't matter who was in the in the crowd yeah. like, one man and his dog and you you just like throw yourself about and <laughs> uh, <laughs> but they were really cool like live and and just had like a certain energy that they they kind of brought to that performance yeah it's interesting that you mentioned there about performing to like one man and his dog, which I, I know, and I'm probably not the only musician or artist who has performed to a crowd of, of no one. Did you ever experience that, performing to an empty, yeah, just the sound guy or sound yeah, woman? Yeah, we did like three-hour drives to perform to like mm. our guitar cases <laughs> and the <laughs> yeah. sound guy. It was, you know, you're like, oh, my God. We, yeah, and, and we all had like crap part-time jobs or something yeah. that we had to be back to the next day and it's like oh god i'm gonna be so tired in the morning and it's been such a waste of time yeah yeah you say you you, know, you do gigs that you don't get paid for for exposure and <laughs> oh. <laughs> then you don't even get any exposure because there's nobody yeah there. um uh, it's that no argument easy. yeah it's a, it was uh you know you're always kind of holding on for you think this will be the one that we we drive you know x amount of hours and we get back at two o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the morning and but it'll be worth it because you know we'll sell some t-shirts and some people will like our music and find us and add our myspace page or (laughs) myspace (laughs) or whatever it whatever it was at the time yeah (laughs) i was having this discussion with uh with a with someone the other day i can't remember who it was it was another podcast episode and we were discussing the old old things that used to be able to put music on did you ever use reverb nation were you yeah. ever of that era i don't yeah. even know if that's still going shout out to reverb nation um 
and there was like a monthly chart on it and we were like the number one band in Taunton and <laughs> like a small town in the southwest and we were like oh this is great oh I don't know what's happened yeah, to it since. I remember I remember even I mean I was I was big fan of MySpace I think yeah. MySpace did a lot for independent musicians and live music and when MySpace died it felt like those little gigs that on a Friday night at a local venue that would pull in like 50 to 100 people stopped getting those 50 to 100 people turning up and mm. those two things whether it's a direct cause and effect thing or just a correlation of the two things happening at the same time but it felt like my MySpace and independent live music sort of took a real downturn around the same time yeah yeah i imagine there probably will be some sort of co correlation there um yeah my i think myspace is still going in itself but as you say it's a totally different animal now and i i wouldn't even yeah. know what it's what it's used for at the moment i remember there was one band that um obviously the arctic monkeys are probably one of the most synonymous bands you find in fame on, on myspace but there was a there was a particular metal band and they were signed to i think it was earache and i remember when we were because i was in a metal band and it was the sort of pathway we all wanted to follow and i cannot i think it was something like Ig ignominious incarceration or something like that it was a really really random name but they totally blew up on myspace and it was the one it was the band that everybody sort of wanted to follow in their footsteps and then obviously it just went Phew! yeah um, and, and and downturned from there um so dan what i'd like to move on to now is uh is is, is moving on to the your current sort of incarnation of uh live performance or going to perform live so what i'd like to uh get from you and for our listeners is is why you've decided to take daniel hugh on the road well it's a it's a strange one really because i think when i started recording solo i was like oh this is great it's just going to be a studio project and i won't have the hassle of live to deal with or to think about um, and especially if I make it, you know, such a big production that it's almost impossible to, <laughs> to, to kind yeah. of do as one man. But I also kind of like a, like solving a problem. Uh, I think that's mm -hmm. what I'm more interested in than the actual performance. It's like, well, how would I, how would I do this live? Yeah. Um, and obviously there's, uh, you know, being, being gone on the retro reverb label, um, there's, I wouldn't, call it pressure but cole always say uh, cole who's um the the label owner always says you know if you do live stuff it's so much easier to kind of promote your release and it's you know it's a great way to generate interest in in your recorded music and and it's it's 100 percent right and I, I know it's yeah. right and it's just kind of taken me this long to get around to trying to put it all together so i think it i think the real driver is solving the problem of, of kind of how would I perform this stuff? Um, what would the focus be? Would it be performance? Would it be, you know, um, sort of sonic accuracy to the actual recording or would it be kind of a bit of a variation on, mm. um, on, on what the recording is or some somewhere in between or a combination of all of those things. But uh, those are the things I'm kind of figuring out, and, and tech-wise, obviously, it's always fun to to, to have to buy new equipment to be yeah. able to solve these problems. So, you know, dropping your monthly paycheck on new music gear is, uh, <laughs> I'm sure, something that <laughs> lots of people listening to this will yeah. uh, will be familiar with. Yeah, definitely. I'm um, interested. A point you mentioned there uh, before we move on to like how you're going to. To turn it into a live sort of animal is um the sort of like the, the representation of your music live because i've had this discussion and I've, I've seen various articles on it are you of a mindset that you'd like to sort of like perform your music verbatim as it is recorded live or are you gonna or do you think are you more of a, a person who likes to see sort of subtle differences to, and variations in the live performance compared to the compared to the recorded version I think I think I prefer the form not necessarily exactly verbatim I think mm. as long as you're singing live you can add your own kind of feeling to to it um and I think when I'm watching a band that I like or an artist that I like perform so 
sometimes when you're trying to kind of sing along with one of your favorite songs it's a bit irritating if they sort of go <laughs> off and do something a bit different and not that i'm suggesting that anybody coming to watch me perform will, will necessarily know any of the songs to sing along with but um but what i'm trying to find i guess is a way to have those options available to either do a kind of you know straight down the middle this is this is basically how my songs sound recorded but you know with the live energy with the volume with the you know with you know me playing live guitar maybe or something or keyboard so it's there's an opportunity to kind of vary it in those senses yeah. but i'd probably be playing to a backing track um yeah. with um you know the, the the song kind of there um to 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 guide me um yeah which is it doesn't make it impossible using uh studio one show page to kind of have variation and even even within even within that backing track you can kind of set it up so that you can have some control over when it goes from say an introduction to a verse or when it goes from a verse into a chorus or how many times you want to repeat the chorus or those kinds of things and and if, if you um if you do the work and watch enough youtube videos <laughs> you can figure out how to kind of really give yourself loads of flexibility yeah and how you in how you perform it and so that's kind of what i'm working towards at the moment really is kind of figuring out all that stuff and and then it's just a case of rehearsing it enough so that I know which button to press <laughs> to, At what to, time. To, to make the, the, these things work the way I want them to. And I'm not going to sort of catch myself off guard and just end the song prematurely <laughs> <laughs> after the first verse. <laughs> yeah. So go, go, let's, uh, let's imagine you're taking uh, your previous album on the road or let's, let's, let's maybe one song in particular when it came to you starting to plan this out what was the first thing you tackled in terms of right i need to iron this out first before i move on to anything else before was it the case of you need to do um, a specific piece of software um a sp specific controller did you have to go in and separate I suppose, stems in your in your mix what was the very first thing you did um so i think it i think the first thing is the decision of what you're going to do live and what you're going to kind of have on the backing track because mm. you've got to then take your mix apart and obviously lead vocals is is the obvious thing but am i going to play guitar am i going to play um you know the um pads or, or whatever on, on the keys am i going to try and do both of those things which is something i'm trying on a couple of songs where i do the guitar solo but play the pads throughout and um so it's kind of making that decision first, like what am I going to play? And then that informs sort of making the backing track uh, or, you know, doing the mix of the mix down of the backing track. And um, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So what what you mentioned in a, in a previous sentence, I think with the, probably with the last question is about how you, are you going to be, you're going to have your backing track, but are you then going to be triggering sections as it were or you just kind of have a backing track much like um you might have if you're in a band you might have an orchestral backing track playing throughout a performance that you then perform to or like you can do with ableton are you going to be triggering samples to play at particular points yeah so that that is a um, that is a functionality that you can do with studio one so, so that's something that prior to this I, I haven't used ableton before so mm my use of studio one show page is like the first my first exposure to that kind of thing where you can so yeah i can i don't know whether i don't know how it works on ableton but with with each song on studio one i can say segment the introduction and then the first verse or i can do it even smaller sections so i could just yeah. have like four beats that i can just run and run and run until i'm ready to hit a button and go on to the next section if, if, if that's what I want to do. And, um, so yeah, so that's, that's something that I'm trying to figure out. I think there's some songs where that's going to work and other songs where it probably, if I'm playing keys and guitar all in one song and doing lead vocals, I might be better off just <laughs> making sure I get to the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> without without screwing it up too much. Yeah, that sounds tricky. I think one of my questions was going to be uh, like, what do you perceive to be the most challenging aspect of it of, of performing live? And that does sound quite challenging in itself. In particular, those songs. Yeah, I think it's um, I think it's changing be- between instruments. I've you know I've not been. Um, I'm not like an amazing pianist and, and, uh, that's something that I kind of, I get a little bit anxious about the idea of performing with, with keys. <clears throat> I'm much more natural on a guitar, not to say that mm. I'm great on guitar, but it comes a little bit more easily to me than, yeah. um, than, uh, than piano does. So, but I think then going between the two and, and knowing that I'm probably going to be kind of overthinking it <laughs> as I do yeah. that and, 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 uh, likely to mess things up. But I think one of the, and it, it kind of, it's one of the really interesting things that I've been considering is, am I trying to do too much? Does anyone care if I'm playing guitar live or playing keys live? Mm. Cause you get lots of people that they'll just kind of sing along to their backing tracks and mm-hmm. their, their actual, their focus is on putting on a good show. It's not on, you know trying to please the musicians in the crowd who are like well he didn't play the guitar live it's like well you know he looked like he was having a great time and he basically yeah got the crowd going and that kind of thing and that's something that i've kind of wondered whether maybe i should simplify rather than try to try to yeah. add in more and more complexity and just be a guy kind of doing a weird project on the stage while everyone's like what what the hell's going on and i'm focusing so much on trying to get things right on the stage that actually nobody has a good time yeah um, so yeah i think that's one of the one of the the kind of questions that goes round and round in my head at the moment is actually should i play less and perform more you know yeah once again interesting point there and i think it's um it kind of resonates with uh, with Gaz and Tom at Honey in Honeybeard. Uh, when I interviewed them, I can't remember what episode it is now. Um, for the audience listening, you can go find that out in the in the feed somewhere. Um, but they they mentioned a similar thing whereby I think they started out and they were taking drum kits and everything with them, and they had this huge setup. Yeah. And then now they've condensed it right down because um, I guess I guess it's similar to what you were saying there is that they were going in thinking they needed to do X, Y, Z and actually you probably need to do a lot less but better in a yeah. way I guess you would say yeah um, and I think uh, Alex uh, Vicchietti uh, I hope I've pronounced Alex's name right um, he, do, he, do, he I've had conversations with him where you know I've been talking about all this stuff because I get excited about buying all the tech and build you know mm-hmm. I'm almost like building the problem to solve. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, just get an iPad and plug your guitar in and you'll be, you know, and that's what he does. And he puts on a really great show and he plays his lead guitar because he's, you know, he's much better on guitar than I am. Um, and he, you know, he has a good time performing his songs and people get into it. And that's probably something that I will, I'll probably kind of take a bit of a mix and match approach because I do want to kind of challenge myself and have, you know the the songs where maybe i am doing a bit more and um but maybe there are opportunities where there's sort of a high energy song that actually it should be about the energy of the song Mm. that that coming across to the crowd rather than me looking like i'm just concentrating on my guitar and getting my keyboard playing right and and yeah like that because no you know no one feeds off a guy staring at the keys whilst trying to (laughs) sing into a microphone you know it's 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 uh yeah it's it's an interesting one yeah yeah definitely and um my next sort of point or question rather was going to be uh having performed you you say you've performed in bands previously and now obviously you're taking the more it's i guess you'd call it more of an electronic sort of outfit in terms of performance do you think there's a different expectation from an audience perspective in terms of what they're what they want or what they're expecting to see because you do see um headline acts and for all intents and purposes they're stood behind a plinth or on a plinth with with a laptop and a few controllers you know do you think there's a different expectation from from, with the audience in terms of what they want to see yeah i'm not sure because i think it i think if you go to these gigs where it's like you know the sort of retro wavy stuff 
you're probably getting quite a knowledgeable crowd, certainly mm. at the sort of independent level um, where people are kind of probably likely to be producers as well and they're, they're sort of listening on a, a more critical. analytical level yeah. and critical level. So I think it's once you get... If, there's a difference between kind of those gigs and if you're like the opening act for like a really decent band who are going to draw in a big crowd of people that potentially aren't all synthwave connoisseurs. They're just people who are fans of, you know, whatever artist it is. And, um, but yeah, I mean, I was watching, I just saw some clips of, uh, is it, is it Ollie Ride? Um, oh yeah. Uh, performing live and, you know, he's a great, he's a great producer and singer and, um, and his live show is is him singing to a backing track, as far as I can tell. But like really putting on a show and getting the crowd involved, and he's yeah. you know he's got a great voice. That's his that's his kind of selling point. Great, that's his yeah his, his biggest selling point is his voice and his energy on stage. Mm. So he's leaning into that and not overcomplicating it. Um, he might have a backing band for all I, I might have just seen a clip of just the front of the stage or something and there might have been a band behind doing it live but um but yeah i, I, I was just kind of like oh that's interesting like I, some of my songs that are a bit lower energy I, I was like okay maybe some of the lower energy songs i could do a bit more you know musical instrument stuff higher energy ones you do a bit less music musical instrument stuff and do a bit more kind of getting the crowd going yeah like so I guess it depends on which, like you say, which, which song you're performing. Then really, yeah, um, yeah. There's a lot to think about, isn't there? It's it's totally different to, I say totally different. It's different to the performing in a band whereby I don't know you've got four or five of you, you got your instruments, and you sort of rock rock up and play. For the audience listening, there is more to it than just that when you when you are performing live. Um, but yeah, it's because it's a lot to think about, and the, the reason why I kind of wanted to get you on today to to, to chat about it is because it's something I've been toying with as well um but a I, I just haven't had the time to look into it and um and b um by the sounds of things you're a lot more clued up on it than i am um but it, it it's it's certainly something that i'm seeing as being more popular um and in conversations online and with various artist producers and whatnot and wanted to take their their outfits on the road with regards to your rig itself um what sort of equipment will you be having in your sort of live setup what equipment do you envisage having so there's obviously the laptop to use to use the the door um and then i built a kind of a, it's a six unit rack with uh so the the main sort of functional stuff is having an audio interface interface um to interact with the door uh di box for guitar um, and uh, channel strip for just some, you know, vocal processing um, prior to prior to going into the door, which is a strange one because I think in a lot of venues you probably just like plug vocals into the PA. Mm. Mm. But because I've got sections of songs where it goes, say, you know, I've, I've got like a low pass and a high pass filter and a load of distortion on the vocals to to kind of you know, fuck it up for the verse so that when it hits the chorus, so I want to kind of be in control of those things. Um, I'm not sure how that'll interact with the kind of PA. I guess I'd just have to tell the sound guy that he can manage the overall volume, but that's about it. Yeah. (laughs) yeah. (laughs) Or like he can EQ the signal that comes, that comes to the desk. But um, so that's, yeah, that's, that's quite an interesting thing that that will be, um, it'll be fun to kind of have that conversation with uh with with sound guys that are really picky about <laughs> yeah about how they manage things um and we'll see we'll see whether there's any flexibility in that at all so are you gonna from your from your live rig then are you gonna have um individual channels and then routing those channels to effectively to the sound desk um to the to the live sound desk so i don't know you vocals guitars drums each individual channel going to the sound desk is that the way you see it happening at the moment no at the moment i've kind of seen it as like just the you just know the, the, the output, output from the the uh, audio interface will go to the to the sound desk mm. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I guess I've got the option of with the DI of kind of using the through and going to an amp as well, but I, that seems a little bit excessive. And also, I've already got all of my guitar amp modelling going on in the door, so then I'd have to try and match that somehow through um, through a guitar amp. So it, it kind of in my head I've, I've probably made it more complicated than it needs to be <laughs> but then i could make it even more complicated and um and re- <laughs> yeah it's 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 going to be it's going to be interesting when it comes to to actually performing um and whether the sound guys say oh well, fine i'll just take the next half an hour as a break <laughs> not worry that's about what it. i was thinking um, yeah, yeah. because yeah i guess i could do with the number of outputs on the interface could probably do my own stage monitoring as well so um yeah and i've got you know i've got a headphone amp as well on that in that rack as well so i'm sort of managing my own sort of in-ear mix oh, okay yeah um so i haven't got a wireless thing at the moment so that might be another <laughs> thing for <laughs> the next payday but um but yeah, they're hard to get, they're hard to find kind of on eBay or anything. They're, they're, I think when people get good ones, they generally tend to hold on to them. So, I oh, got a wireless kit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember when I was looking for a wireless wireless guitar kit, and I never really. I, I don't think I ever found one I particularly liked. I went through a Shaw. I think I had a Shaw. I can't remember what it was. I had a Line Six wireless as one at one point as well. Um, I sacked it off in the end. Just went back to having having wired, but. I suppose going back to what you said there about like if you're just having your stereo out going to the desk, it does make the the sound engineer's life a bit easier. And I suppose it also means that there's less chance of them sort of fucking up what you've created for one of a better yeah, way yeah. of putting it. Um, the, the, you, you retain all that creative control, and all they they basically just got two faders left and right, which are they're just going to push up to yeah to um, to go out over the PA. Yeah, it means that I've got to get my back in track kind of mix right um, yeah yeah because that's the other thing is obviously that um say take the last ep for example what like somebody else mastered it for me so i've then got to kind of um you know get my bass levels right and, and you know get all the um so yeah so i've got to do my backing tracks and then master them and and really get that kind of at the level that I want it to be at and not just assume that, you know, a, an EQ on a desk can fix, <laughs> 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 fix something that's, that's kind of really badly, um, you know, badly mixed. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I can imagine. Uh, now, now, now you point all these things out. I'm thinking actually there, there is a lot to consider when taking these things on and they're like hats off to, to any artist who is a solo artist and then performs their stuff their music live and has to juggle all these different intricacies yeah um, but i suppose the more you do it you you can refine it and and hone and hone your skills and your talents and i think once you've got it once you've got it set up and you so my my issue at the moment is that the the live set i'm building features probably about i'm just focusing on kind of six songs and it's like three songs from my new album and three songs from the previous ep but because it's got songs from my new album, the mixes keep kind of slightly changing. And I keep, you know, you know, when you're in that process of yep. kind of a month or two before release and, and you think you've got everything finished. So I, you know, I make a backing track and then I bounce, bounce it and then I master it. And then I come back and change the actual track. And then I've got to <laughs> like do yeah. it all over again. And I should probably just kind of sit tight until I'm absolutely sure that, the the tracks are the ones that are going to be released but um yeah yeah it it makes it a bit kind of having that going on at the same time uh it's difficult you know you're just excited you want to kind of get on and play with this stuff but at the same time you're probably just wasting a load of energy (laughs) yeah yeah i do that all the time to be fair going back and forth with mixes even even before i've even thought about taking anything on the road live i'm continuously going back and forth and um, that's kind of a nice segue, really, to, to the next sort of topic, which is your new album. Uh, so you mentioned that you're going to be taking three tracks on the road. So I've seen you online, you've, uh, you've rebranded as well. Um, what, what was the idea behind the rebrand before we move on to the album? Uh, there was a couple of things. 
Uh, one was the <laughs> my sort of for previous logo was something that I made myself using GIMP, uh, which <laughs> is a free kind of. Um, it's like a freeware version of Photoshop, which is actually like mm-hmm. very, very cool if you if you mm-hmm. actually know what you're doing with graphic design and it can do most of what Photoshop can do, but for free. But I'm not a graphic designer, so I made something that was kind of passable. I wanted it to be a bit synth wavy, a bit like neon in, neon-ish. And, yeah. Um, and then I think when I started writing new stuff, it felt a bit more kind of more synth pop than synth wave, not to want to get into like splitting hairs over genre mm. titles or anything, but it, it did, it doesn't necessarily fit into that <clears throat> sort of synth wavy, like neon, you know, the future that futuristic future that yeah, never existed what or whatever. It's actually more like eighties revival or at least in a lot of ways. I think it does have crossover into some of that stuff, but um, but I, I see it more as like 80s revival synth pop than, yeah, than that kind of synth wave um, traditional sort of cyberpunky approach. So, yeah, so I kind of wanted a bit more of a um, a reflection of that like synth poppy style rather than synth wavy. Um, and also just getting somebody else to do it to make it actually look decent <laughs> rather than my crappy graphic design skills, which, uh, um, yeah, I've been kind of looking at all the time and thinking, Christ, I need a new logo that actually makes me look good when, you know, it's that first impression thing, isn't it? You don't mm. get a second chance at it. And if, if you've got like shit branding, then it's a, it's a shame, but there's a chance that people are going to not even give your music a chance if you're, if your logo's not very good. So that was kind of what I was thinking. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean when it comes to sort of outsourcing. I've done that recently. And thankfully on on the label, um, there's like somebody who can do everything. So there's um, names now, isn't it? Marlon, after yeah, artwork. Yeah, yeah, really, really good. Uh, Zhao, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, did a lyric video for me as well recently. Because um, yeah, I like most... That. Yeah, yeah, much like yourself, I was just kind of, I was doing it, my, and, and I was just saying, you know what? I mean, the the hours and the time I'm putting into this, and it's kind of like less than satisfactory. I could just get somebody else who knows what they're doing. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And I think it, it's like if you if you know you've got a sort of pot of money that you're willing to throw at a project, it's you know it's just making the decisions on on kind of where do I want to spend the money, where do I want to try and do mm-hmm. things myself, and um yeah i think kind of graphic design and that kind of thing is definitely one of those places where people can tell when when someone who knows what they're doing has done it and um even if they don't consciously think of it that way it's just it's just really obvious it's like a bad drummer in a band isn't it like mm. even if you're not musical <laughs> it's so you pick obvious. it out <laughs> you can yeah you yeah. just know something's not right and uh, I think it's also as well uh, for all for all for how good Canva is. There's only a certain amount of time that I could spend on Canva. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I yeah. mean, it is amazing that some of the stuff that that mm. I've managed to do on there, where I thought I'm probably going to have to spend money on this, but I'll just see if I can play around and make something happen. And um, and yeah, like it, I do love Canva, and I can lose yeah. hours and hours and days yep. just to kind of playing around on it. But I think Canva's great for just like generating some social media content and getting some getting some things kind of looking, you know, semi semi decent and passable on on social media. But um, yeah, like it's it's not the same as paying someone who knows really how <laughs> yeah. to, to use Photoshop and, um, and, and just has like an artistic eye. I think that's the other thing is like, I can try on Canva and I can sometimes make stuff that's good, but to have someone that's actually an artist come up with an idea and, or like interpret your, uh, interpret your words into something. I just think that's something totally different. Yeah, oh, I totally agree. I totally agree. Um, and it, it comes down to how much you value your time as well, I think. Because ultimately, yeah, it costs you money. But uh, yeah, it, it's time. And I'd rather dedicate that time. I don't know about you. Like, 
to doing something I'm actually good at, which is probably like music. <laughs> yeah. Rather than, um, rather than, uh, I suppose I could dedicate time to getting into graphic design, but I don't know. That's just a rabbit hole. I don't want to go down. You know. Yeah, you do end up spending hours like watching stuff on YouTube and then being like. Uh, yeah, I think I've just confirmed that I can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. So moving on to the new album then, uh, can you tell our audience a bit about, so you mentioned just then that you're sort of moving in, it's a bit more sort of synth pop, um, sort of retracing the eight steps from the 80s, music from the 80s. What what can our audience sort of expect? How many tracks? Um, have you got a title for it yet? Yeah, yeah, you can have a you can have an exclusive of the, oh, of the title yep. if you want. So, so yep. the album's going to be called Now or Never, um, and uh, it's going to be coming out on May the sixth, uh, which is uh, sort of terrifyingly close. Actually, when I think about it, it's only a couple of months away. Uh, yeah, got a single coming out on. March the 18th, which is even even closer, um, yeah. we, which is a collaboration with Emily Zuzik from Woves. Um, oh, brilliant. Which, yeah, which is really cool. And, um, yeah, we're both kind of really excited. And it's kind of been in the pipeline for quite a long time. And it's just kind mm. of, um, you know, just you just got to kind of be patient with these things really don't you, you know, yeah wait, yeah wait for your release slot and and stuff so yeah so it's nine tracks the album all together uh it's a bit of a weird one actually because it was going to be an ep i'd got six tracks written and then in one weekend i wrote two songs um that i was just kind of so excited about that i just said to cole that i was i was like i think i'm just gonna have to push back the release because i just need these songs to be on there so then it was going to be eight tracks um and then and then i just decided to do kind of a little sort of instrumental outro for the for the album just to just to make it up to kind of about half an hour (laughs) of music so that we could do a tape cassette like um like a physical release um just because i knew i had that kind of little um, sort of amount of time that that would be empty empty tape just rolling over at the end so i was like i'll do and i'll do a little little outro but yeah it's um it's just about there um and ready to go now so it's it's exciting that sounds brilliant and um emily's great uh, i love wives i think they're fantastic so yeah wow. so I'm looking she's forward to just that. so i mean she she could just do anything with her voice because i don't know have you heard her sort of um would you call it like americana like rock no stuff? she's that like really awesome and it's Ooh, quite I rare that. i think that you get vocalists that can just turn their hand to or turn their voice i guess to any genre and make it sound totally natural without changing the way that they sing um mm. i think that's impressive you know, lots of people would like go to a different genre and almost change the the style that they they sing i know i know i have probably really going from rock to sort of pop and synth stuff i think i've I've sort of changed the way that i approach vocals um but she's just she's just unbelievable and she she wrote the lyrics to that song um so it was a song that i'd kind of produced and i'd had sitting there for a while and i couldn't figure out any vocals to it and i actually asked her to sing vocals on another track um that i'd written and i'd written all the all the lyrics for and stuff and she wasn't that interested in it um but she said if i had any others that um send it over and i was like well actually i'll just send her this one because i've been sitting on it for ages and she immediately just you know or something clicked with it and she could hear kind of the melody and stuff straight away and um yeah so she came up with all the vocals and um and yeah it's, it's just you know nothing that like, i wouldn't have come up with anything like what she came up with which i think is the really cool thing about you know collaborating with people you you just if you sent you that track to six different people you'd probably get six totally different approaches to it um but yeah it's going to be really cool i think people are going to really like it that sounds amazing i'm, I'm looking forward to hearing that and, and the new material and I totally sort of echo what you say there. It is, it's amazing, isn't it, when you, you have, like, an instrumental and then you send it off to someone. Because that's the way I do things. So I'm not the great lyricist. I can write lyrics for metal. Yeah. I write, write lyrics for pop. I struggle with. 
Um, if it's about like wizards and warlocks and stuff like that in metal, I'm all over it or like hammer horror. But when it comes to uh, synth pop, I'm kind of like, nah, I should probably get someone in. Much like the graphic design, I should probably get someone in who's much better, better at writing this than me. And then when the, when you get that come back and you're like, and it just totally like breathes new life into your music. Yeah. I think it's it's a great feeling when you when you hear that back. I love have it. you it's have great. you collaborated with? Um people where they've sent you stuff to kind of add to or, or is it always i haven't yet i haven't yet I, i'm a sinner for um not following these things up and it's like it's a kind of bad trait of mine so i've, is... I've got this, <laughs> this sort of frustration that i think i write and deliver better vocals when someone asks me to sing on their stuff than i do for my own <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. really, I, I've done a, a, a few collaborations recently. Stuff, none of it's been released yet, um, but it's probably some of the best stuff that I've actually done. And I'm like, do I need to go back and re- <laughs> re-record all of my album? Because yeah, I've just I, there's something about kind of someone asking you to do something. I think that for me makes me kind of push myself to a, a bit of a better, a higher standard. Yeah um yeah so well i hope they i hope the people that i've collaborated with think that as well but um yeah, yeah it feels like of, it to me i know what you mean i've um i've had commissions whereby like someone's asked me to sort of co-produce and i've gone in and i've added little flourishes here and there um to tracks and i know what you mean i th- I, I i think i had this discussion once again with someone i think it might have been lewis of max a few weeks back whereby if you if you've got time constraints or a deadline i find that when I've got that hanging over me, I'm much more finite. I'm much more focused, and I find that whatever I, whatever I do, sound, not that it sounds better, but I just get that get to the end, the end line, the finishing line quicker. Yeah. Um, than I would otherwise, because when it's my own music, oh man, I'm I'm terrible for dragging it out. I wonder Absolutely whether when it's terrible. somebody else's song, whether it's easier to make decisions. I wonder whether I think sometimes you're a bit like you're a bit more objective. You're a bit like, no, that sounds good. That sounds crap. I'm going to do this and this, and and that that's my kind of decision. Whereas with my stuff, I kind of agonise over one line for like a day. Yeah, yeah. I think you're right. I think that's what it is because because specifically if they've sent you parts already, and I'm listening to it, I'm like, well, that's that, that's that, that's that. They don't want me to touch that, so I'm now just going to go in and add this. Where if it's my own. I'd be like, oh, I'll put that in, but that means I'll go and change that. It's like I was I was working on a track on Friday, and the opening of the track is a is a load of foley sounds, and it's someone getting in a car and some music playing and mm. stuff. And I probably spent two hours just finding like the perfect car opening sound <laughs> of a door, um, and then the closing of a door, and then a static radio, uh, someone tuning a radio. Um, whereas I think if somebody commissioned me to do it, I probably would have just done it, or, or asked me to collaborate with them rather. I probably would have done it just a lot quicker. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. I think you're on. To, I, th- I think you're onto something there, and I think it's right. Um, maybe I need to change. We need to change our mindsets and just have that fict- a fictitious deadline. Yeah. Um, yeah. Some, sometimes that's really good. Just to say, look, this song's going to be done by the end of the week, whatever, mm. and then, and then. Yeah, yeah. So um, about time to, to to wrap this up now, Dan. So a big thank you again. So where, where can our um, audience find you online? So. Uh, I think, and I hope, all of my social media tags are at Daniel Hugh Music. So I am on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, I got a TikTok account last week, so I did I see. I've I... got a couple of followers, but I could do with some. Uh, I could do with some help on there. I mean, no idea what I'm doing really. It just seems to be videos of people doing dance routines mostly but um <laughs> but i'm trying to figure i'm trying to figure that whole world out and um yeah so all the usual places and Bandcamp, obviously um where we sell our we sell our lovely music is danielhugh.bandcamp.com um and then obviously just search me on on spotify and all the other standard streaming and download places and and uh, hopefully you'll come across my stuff brilliant um what i'll do is I'll, I'll put all those links in the in the show notes as well for the audience to go in and check out um dan and um yeah any any help on tiktok uh please do do follow dan i've i've made that uh, jump in as well uh, probably like two or three weeks before you and it is 
yeah i don't really know what i'm doing either i just post videos and see what no, happens. i think um, i think you're i think you're getting it right like it's just kind of regular and very concise stuff that people are actually going to be interested mm. in and i haven't quite figured out what i've got to show people that they'll actually be interested in so <laughs> I, I think there's a vital piece of the puzzle there that i, <laughs> yeah. that I need to figure out and it's trends as well. I'm led, I'm led to believe that you've got to jump on trends. And I look at the trends. I'm like, well, that, none of that is applicable to what I'm doing. So no. Some, I, I don't know. I, I think mean, it's a whole... As soon as I hear yeah. the word trends, I just I just think it's just a bunch of twats. <laughs> 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 yeah. I just, I'm so contrarian. Like, even if it was something I was really interested in, I'd, I'd have to decide that I didn't like it anymore. I need to, I need to sh- stamp down that part of my personality and just jump on board yeah. the bandwagon and, and really sort of milk it dry. <laughs> I love that. Well, Dan, uh, yeah, again, a massive thanks for joining me on this again today. And um, good luck with the, with the album release and the single release. I'll be sure to, to share it as and where as awesome. when i can as well appreciate and, um, it yeah we'll we'll put links to to all your music stuff in the in the show notes and um lovely yeah enjoy the rest of your evening mate and it's uh, it's good catching up with you i'll speak to you soon yeah thanks very much for having me cheers mate yeah cheers mate bye